Okay? So let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark, the second book of the New Testament. Last Sunday, we started a, a little sh- a short three-part message, our s- three-part series that's focused on how we can be joining God in the mission that He's accomplishing in the world. How do we get in on what God is doing in the world so that we, by being on mission as a church, and that's the title of this little series, just our mission, how we can be fulfilling our purpose for God, that God has for us in our church. And in order for us to be doing those things that God's called us to do, we have to understand what our purposes are, what God's called us to do, what God wants us to be busy with, attending to. We have to understand the core purposes that God has for us as a church. And so last Sunday, we started with our mission. Today, I want to talk about another part of that. Because listen, If we want to bring Jesus Christ glory in the church, then we have to be about our Father's business. Amen? Hello? We must be about His business. Not our business, not our agenda, but His agenda. And we're told in Scripture by Jesus Himself what God's agenda is and how we can get in on what God is doing and what God wants. Now, before Jesus left earth, He made our mission very, very clear. We don't have to guess it. We don't have to figure it out. We don't have to get out our theological slide rulers and compasses and try to figure out what God's purpose for us as a church is. We don't have to get really creative and read a lot of books and figure it out and have brainstorming sessions. What does God want us to be doing as a church? What He wants us to be doing hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Amen? It's simple. And it's recorded for us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. So now you're at at Mark chapter 1. Turn back one page or just look back to the prior chapter, the last one in Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18. These should be, I hope for you, really familiar words, and I pray the Holy Spirit will rescue their over-familiarity from you from their over-familiarity so that you can hear them with fresh ears today. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus, this is right after he's resurrected, about to ascend to heaven, came to the disciples and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you. I'm with you in this task, always, to the end of the age. That right there is the vision and the mission of the Savior for His church, for this church, and every church that gathers in Jesus' name. And it hasn't changed in two millennia. That right there is Jesus' own method for accomplishing His purposes in the world against All that list of things Gus Seeger read for us before he prayed this morning. That's his method. And so there are three core things we as a congregation must be focused on and busy about in our Father's business in order to get join God in what He is doing in the world and what God wants us to do as a congregation that gathers in His name. Three things. The first I addressed last Sunday. We must be fulfilling the mission. The mission of simply bearing witness to our neighbors and to the nations of the saving grace of God. We have a word for that. We call that evangelism. 
And we call that missions. We must be fulfilling the mission of evangelizing locally and fulfilling the mission globally to our neighbors and to the nations. Bearing witness. Secondly, we must be discipling others. Building up disciples who multiply more disciples. The language there is directly from Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. And then third, I'm using the word community. Mission, discipling, and community. By community, I simply mean becoming the kind of church that's growing in gospel love for one another. And so those are the three parts of this little series. Now, in that Great Commission command we just read, you see Jesus calling us to do something. To do what He's been doing His entire earthly ministry. Now, it includes evangelism, obviously. It is believers... Most of us know, most of us Christians know that evangelizing other people is really important. Amen? That's not negotiable. That's not optional. It's really, really important. That's our mission, that we must spread the message of the good news about Jesus Christ. We must lead people to put their faith in Jesus Christ and then baptize them as public witness to their faith in Jesus Christ. It's all part of that evangelistic process. And churches spend a lot of time talking and motivating and training and mobilizing Christians to spread the gospel as churches should, as believers should. Because that's the only way this world's going to get any hope whatsoever. And the hope we've got is eternal hope. We know we must be about that. We spend a lot of time in talking and motivating and mobilizing and even giving toward that mission. But most of the time, we stop there. And we emphasize, and we're really good at emphasizing that first half of the Great Commission. And we can emphasize it so much that we never get around to the second part of the Great Commission, the part about discipling. But I need you to understand, and by God's grace I hope you will, that, that discipling people is just as important as evangelizing. But you wouldn't know that to look at the average Christian and the average you wouldn't know that. Because most of us, let's be honest, most of us have never been discipled. In all our years of knowing the Lord, we've never been discipled. And in all our years, we've never discipled someone else. And frankly, we've rarely, if ever, actually ever seen it done. Tragically, I, I've, I've asked the question over and over again in my, in my years of pastoring. How many, I won't do it now, but how many of you have someone discipled you? And it's usually only a small, small percentage of the hands of anyone in the room. Someone discipled them. And then to ask the question, have, how many of you have taken the time, the investment to and disciple someone else intentionally and even fewer hands? Well, if I did that today, I probably would get the similar kinds of response. And tragically, tragically, and I say this not, not chidingly to us, but I say this genuinely from my heart, tragically, we have little to no experience in the very thing Jesus spent his entire ministry focusing on. How has this happened? I think two things I want to bring to your attention. Number one, that Jesus' entire life 
was aimed at accomplishing his mission. I think we would all agree there. His entire life was aimed at accomplishing his mission. So let's just trace it for a moment together. When, when Jesus arrived in the flesh, right here on our territory, he came to accomplish the plan that God had planned from before the beginning of the world, right? We know this. That was always in the front of his mind, always in the front of his mind. From the beginning, he didn't have to figure this out and come to a conclusion. From the beginning, he had always intended to save a people for himself and to build a church, a global church, that nothing, not even hell itself, could prevail against. That was always his intention from the beginning. And so from the beginning, Jesus' sights were set on the day his kingdom would come in glory and in power, right? We know this is his plan. How did he do it, though? What was his method? Well, to do it, he willingly became the Savior of the world. That's a phrase used in the Gospel of John the Savior of the world, because God wants the people He made to put their trust in Jesus so they can be saved. God wants the people He made to be saved. We know that's His will. We know God's will is that the people He made come to a saving knowledge of Him in truth and in trust in the Savior He sent us, Jesus Christ. And to accomplish that, Jesus' entire life was designed to give himself a body so he could die a sacrificial death to atone for the sins of anyone who'd ever put their faith in him. His entire life was ordered and organized around that objective. Everything he did, everything he said, had significance. Not a wasted word. Listen, everything he said and did because was significant because it contributed to the ultimate purpose of his life. Redeeming people from sin. Redeeming a people for God. That was the motivating vision of his life. That's what governed all his behavior and everything he ever said. All his steps were ordered by his mission. And not for one moment did Jesus ever lose sight of that goal. And that's why it's so important to understand the way Jesus operated to achieve that holy objective. So let's think about that. The way Jesus operated the strategy he took to fulfill that mission of redeeming a people from their sins for God. What was his method? Because the way Jesus operated reveals God's strategy to conquer this world with all of its messed up messiness. Jesus, you can see it in him. You can read it. You can see it when you read it in the text. Jesus was completely confident in his strategy. You can see it in every move he makes. There was nothing haphazard about his life. There was nothing wasted in his energy. There was no wasted word he ever uttered. So focused, so on mission, he was totally about his father's business. Even at 12 years old, when his parents can't find him, he's there in the synagogue dealing with the the smarter people, as it were, in the room, totally about his father's business. He lived, died, and rose again right on schedule. And all he did, he did all he ever did, knowing he was fulfilling the strategy of God, that would not fail. And his strategy, I will tell you, his strategy is so unassuming, 
so silent that it's unnoticed by hurried, distracted Christians. Number two, here it is, that Jesus' method for accomplishing his mission was the multiplication of disciples. You're going to be amazed by the simplicity of this. You might even be a little bewildered as you see this unfold, that Jesus' plan for accomplishing his mission is so different from that of most churches and most Christians. It's so different. You understand that Jesus' method is people. People are his method. Now, I don't know about you, but I am a people. (laughs) And you're a people. People are his method. It's really simple. I'm telling you, this is unassuming. This is overlooked. It's maybe even a little bewildering. Here's how it started. Let's trace Jesus' non-haphazard steps and watch his strategy unassumingly unfold. And remember as you're watching this, it seems so insignificant to us, and yet it's the method God chose wisely to conquer the world. Nothing like our methods. It all started like this. It all started with Jesus calling a few men the following. What it strikes me, and I want to point this out from the beginning, that Jesus' strategy was not to enact a program to reach the masses. But that's always where we want to default, isn't it, as churches? Jesus did not enact a program to reach the masses. His program, his method, was to train a few who the masses would follow. Discipling men was his method for winning the world to God. Discipling a few men who would bear witness to his life and who would carry on his work of discipling after him, after he left. Let's watch it. Matthew, or Mark, rather, chapter 1, verse 16. Peter and Andrew are the first ones to be invited as Jesus leaves the scene of his, of his own baptism. Mark, chapter 1, verse 16. Passing along the sea, alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that's Peter, and Andrew, the brother of Simon. They're casting a net into the sea. They're fishing. They're in the middle of their job, middle of their work day. They were fishermen. Verse 17. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men, people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. James and John are next. Jump down to verse 19. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. Shortly after that, Matthew, the tax collector, a lot of these guys have two names. The tax collector joins in. He's called Levi here. Look at Mark chapter 2. Turn over there to verse 13. 2, 13. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him. And he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, you guessed it, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And we know the rest of the story, many of us do, that eventually Jesus hand-selects 
12 men. Look at chapter 3, verse 13. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. He went up on the mountain. He prays about it. We're, we're told from the other gospel writers. He prays and before he does this. And he specifically calls to himself those whom he desired. And they came to him. Verse 14. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him. Watch, watch what he's doing. Here's his method. He's calling them to himself so they might be with him. They're going to walk with him. They're going to talk with him, share meals with him, share the road journey with them. They're going to sleep in the same place, eat, walk, talk, pray together, play together, all the above, that, he might be, that they might be with him, sharing life. Read on. And that he might send them out to preach. And have authority to cast out demons. And you can see their names, by the way, in the next couple of verses. If you just glance your eye down, there's Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip. You see Bartholomew and Matthew, Thomas, James, Thaddeus, Simon, and of course Judas, the infamous Judas, the betrayer, chosen to fulfill the purposes of God handing Jesus over for his crucifixion. But as you might expect, these early steps in Jesus' ministry, listen, his early steps had very little immediate effect. At least on the multitudes. But do you realize that didn't matter to Jesus? Not yet. As it turns out, these few early converts to following Jesus, these these 12 guys, they are destined to become the leaders of his global church that's soon going to take the gospel to the entire world, these 12. So actually, the significance of the lives of these few men Their lives are going to be felt throughout eternity. And which is the only thing that counts, by the way. And what's striking about these men is that they don't impress us very much when we meet them. (laughs) That's really striking. They're a ragtag bunch. They even have different political views, and they're in the same group. Jesus' disciples. None of them, none of them are prominent in society. None of them are prominent even in the synagogue. They're not necessarily well-known, influential religious guys. They're not wealthy. They're just average, ordinary, hardworking men. I mean, not exactly the kind of people you'd expect to win the world for Christ and turn it on its head. Amen? Amen? Later in the book of Acts, it'll, it'll, they said of them, these men have turned the world upside down. Never expect that meeting them early on in their life, like, you, like we are here in Mark 1 and 3. And yet Jesus intentionally chooses these men. Why? To invest in them and to reproduce himself in them to make these men not just into disciples, but into disciple makers. That's what Jesus is after. Disciple makers. Men who would multiply themselves into other people, who would then turn around and multiply themselves into other people, and into other people, and into other people, until the nations hear of the good news. They're supposed to do to others what Jesus has done with them. Multiply. Now listen, they may not have been very highly educated men. In fact, later in the book of Acts, they recognize these guys are not, they don't sound very erudite. They don't sound intelligent. They're not highly educated men. Probably the best training they ever got, or the highest level of training they ever got, was to how to do their day job. Cast nets and repair them. Catch the fish and sell them. 
And yet what set them apart was that they were teachable. Teachable. They were honest men who were willing to confess their need. And they had a sincere yearning for God. And they wanted to learn the life of faith. And they were looking for someone to lead them into that life and to that God and mold them into God's image. That's what they wanted. And that's what they got. And they got it because they were teachable. And Jesus can use anyone who wants to be used. And so Jesus' method was to focus on discipling a few men with his life. But don't miss the practical truth of how Jesus did it, how he did it. And if we'll pay attention to this, we'll see that Jesus' method is divinely wise. I mean, Jesus knew, think about this, Jesus knew that the only way to change the world was to do it one life at a time. See, we don't really believe that. Because we always want to influence the masses. We always want to give our money and our our time and our energy and our effort, we're magnetically drawn toward whatever is the biggest crowd and the biggest movement, the loudest voices in the street. Jesus is just the opposite. He knows the only way to change the world is one life at a time, and that's why he gave. Think, think about this for a second. This is why he gave the three and a half short years of his earthly ministry to discipling 12 guys. Not the way we would have done it. Because we think our ways are better. (laughs) More effective. More successful. But Jesus intentionally, armed with the wisdom and the plan of God, intentionally focused on discipling only a few people at once. Teaching them. Molding them into effective servants of God. This was deliberate, y'all. This was deliberate, and it's been globally effective. Do you realize that Jesus literally staked his whole ministry on discipling a few men? Let that land on you for a minute. He's, his whole ministry is dependent on these 12 guys. Why? Why did Jesus deliberately concentrate his life on so few people? I mean, didn't he come to save the world? Well, of course he did. I mean, surely Jesus, he could have recruited an army of men, couldn't he? So the answer to the question of why did Jesus deliberately concentrate his life on so few people, the answer has to do with the real purpose of his mission. He didn't come to impress the crowds. He came to inaugurate a kingdom. And that means he needed people who could lead the crowds to follow his ways. He didn't want people to remain as sheep who have no shepherds. He'd already seen that. Jesus had literally wept over Jerusalem with that in his heart and his mind. The people were unled and they were unfed. They were sheep without a shepherd. They're unguided. They're misguided. They'll follow anything that comes along, listen to any old voice, eat any old bad food, as it were, as sheep. They'll do anything. They're a sheep without a shepherd. So what does Jesus do? He trains some shepherds. Jesus does want to build an army, but he wants to build an army of well-trained, competent, mature disciples who can lead others into a growing, maturing, obedient life of faith. Jesus is 
after not just people getting in the kingdom, but growing and strong in Him and in His Word. It's God's passion for you and for me. And that's God's wise reason for intentionally discipling a few teachable men. And then Jesus turned around and did something uncomfortable. He turned around and he assigned his very same personal method to us. He assigned his method to us. For us to follow. For us to replicate. For us to disciple others. Who multiply more disciples of Jesus. Who multiply more disciples of Jesus. See, Jesus' mission isn't merely addition. Just get a crowd and add another and add another and add another and add another. His mission isn't addition. His mission is multiplication. His mission isn't just to attract big crowds. It's to multiply disciples who multiply disciples who multiply disciples. This is the difference between... Saving your dollars one at a time and sticking them under your mattress, that's addition, right? That's one way to save a nest egg. Versus the other way. You know what that is? Putting your money where it can earn compound interest. Now your money is multiplying itself. This is the difference in the method Jesus approached. He's not just saving his dollars one by one under the mattress. He's using his dollars to build compound interest, to snowball. This is your entire retirement has been banked on this this principle. And yet when we come into the ministry, we do it the opposite way. When we come into the life of faith, we do it by addition and not multiplication. And yet our, uh, we, we plan on eating in our older years and paying our light bill based on the principle of compound interest, multiplication. That's actually Jesus' ministry. That's his mission. That's his method. Because that's how the multitudes will be saved. That's the genius of Jesus' strategy. And that's why it's part of the Great Commission. See, churches today, they just want bigger crowds. You know what Jesus wants? Mature disciples. He wants us to make disciples. There's a huge emphasis in Christianity. Huge emphasis on just more baptisms, more baptisms, more baptisms. And nearly no emphasis on discipling others. When we get the questionnaires as a Southern Baptist church, And I say this as a glad Southern Baptist. Glad to be one. I end this on purpose. We get the questionnaire every year to report on attendance and and revenues. All these things. They just collect any of the data just to see the general health of the church. There's, There's one question that's been on the questionnaire forever and ever and ever, and it's how many baptisms this year. There's never once yet been on that form the question, how many disciples did you make? But that's the question that ought to be on there. Amen? Hello? That's part of the Great Commission. How many disciples did you make? Baptisms is the only measure. But that's the only one we tend to measure. And failing at discipling, we are failing the mission. Yes, we must do evangelism so people can be saved. We are celebrating that here. You've just heard for the last number of weeks and months conversations that people are having. We want to celebrate your conversations with people about the gospel so that they can be saved. But listen, let me tell you what we cannot do. We cannot be content to have the conversations and see them come into the kingdom and celebrate that and baptize them and then just drop them. We cannot be content with that. But that's what we tend to do. Here's... So often, we baptize someone, and they're wondering, okay, I've been baptized. I I publicly profess my faith. What do I do now? And here's what we say. Uh, 
just, just keep showing up. Just come. Just keep showing up. You know what that's called? Dropping the ball. That's a major, major fumble. That's like, for you football fans, that's like playing the first half of the game and driving the ball and getting the score and getting it done and getting to halftime and we're celebrating the locker room and we think we're done. And then we go back out to the game and we're not doing the discipleship half of the Great Commission and we keep fumbling the ball. It's like running it down and we're fumbling the ball at halftime and we're fumbling the ball at halftime and we're fumbling the ball at halftime. You don't win games that way. We do the first part of the Great Commission and we fumble the second half not realizing the second half counts just as much or more than the first. You know, you don't win by getting the, by, by, by getting the ball to the 50-yard line. You get it in the end zone. So our mission doesn't stop at baptism, the halftime celebration. The mission keeps going. The commission of Jesus tells us what we must be doing. We must be discipling people personally, intentionally, investing in someone else. But most Christians never do that. They never do what Jesus did. They never do what Paul did when he told Timothy, Timothy, what you heard from me, Now, what you heard from me, now you tell to the presence of many, and and trust that to faithful men who will be able to tell others also. There you have four generations, from Paul to Timothy to faithful men who are others also, four levels there. That's Paul and Timothy and faithful men getting in on what Jesus spent his life doing. And most of us have never experienced that. Most of us never do that. We never participate in Jesus' main work. And you know what? We miss out on Jesus' plan for our life to be fruitful for him. And I don't want to get to heaven. I've been thinking about this. I don't want to get to heaven. And, he, and, and be like that servant in Matthew 25 that Jesus gave a talent and he buried it in the dirt I don't want you and I don't want me to hear Jesus ask us why we didn't do what he said to do with what he gave us. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that position. I don't, it's just like when Jesus asked all those people in that story about the judgment day, the story about the judgment day, remember the sheep and the goats? And he's asking the people why, why they didn't feed him when he was hungry and why they didn't clothe him when he was naked and why they didn't visit him when he was in prison. He's asking the question. And they were like, oh, we're, we didn't know you were na- As much as you didn't do it to the least of these that were my brothers and sisters, you didn't do it to me. And so what I don't want to do is I don't want to hear Jesus ask why I didn't disciple the people God put all around my life to invest my life into and into his word, and I just buried it in the dirt. I don't want to hear that. I want you to hear, and I want me to hear, the well done, good and faithful servants, you actually did the second part of the Great Commission. You discipled others. That's what I want you to do. That's what I want you to be able to hear. And you can. And we're going to hear to help you. So here's what we're doing. And here's what we're planning as a congregation. And again, I'll tell you, this is like cultivating a garden. We want to cultivate a culture of discipleship here at First Baptist. We said it last Sunday, we're going to cultivate a culture of evangelism and mission where that is normal, where people are sharing their faith. That's the normal part of our lives. We're sharing the faith. We're hearing about people sharing their faith. We're seeing people come to Jesus. We're seeing them baptized. But we also want to cultivate the culture of discipling people, which is part of the Great Commission. A culture, a church, the kind of church where we are being very, very intentional, not haphazard, not maybe, not accidentally, but intentional about personally helping other people grow in Christ. A culture where that's normal. 
where that's characteristic of us as a church, where it's not just where we go, wow, that girl, she's really growing. Think about that, that it surprises us when there's somebody who's really growing in the Lord. We need to flip the script. Where it ought to surprise us that somebody's not growing. They're not being discipled. They're not pouring their life into someone else. That needs to become characteristic of us as a congregation. Where it's clear in our minds. And it's evident in our behavior and our actions. And where it is normal in our church for people to be coming to faith in Jesus. And it's normal for all of us to be personally Helping other people grow spiritually instead of hoping they figure it out on their own. Hope they just show up and figure it out, pick it up by osmosis. Folks, this is our mission. This is our job. Our job is our personal participation in Jesus' plan that he invested his entire life in. So we can be personally involved in God's strategy. Not bystanders, not looking out in from the outside, watching everybody else do it. And when that becomes true of us as a congregation, the more it becomes true of us as a congregation, I should say. Because it's happening some now. I see it. It's happening. When that becomes normal, we begin to bring Jesus maximum glory in his church. So let me just close out with these four layers of discipleship that we're cultivating here. Four layers. The first layer, think of it like a foundation. I'm going to build a pyramid real quick here. The first layer of discipleship as a congregation happens every Sunday morning during worship right here, right now. We're all being discipled together in this moment to some degree. It's when we all gather for worship and prayer and to hear the preaching of God's word, to hear the revelation of God speaking to us through his word. And we come here to do that so that we can grow in the truth and in the knowledge of the Lord together. That's just layer one. And may God help us not to get stuck on layer one. Layer two happens just before we gather here where at 9.30 every Sunday we are offering classes that are designed, are being designed to teach you rich content of Scripture so that you can invest in your own spiritual growth and we can invest in your spiritual growth in a concentrated classroom setting. We are after your maturity in Christ, not just filling your head with knowledge, Bible knowledge. So we go from the large gathering to some smaller gatherings, the classes. And let me tell you, we are offering right now book classes, and we will be offering more of these. We offer classes right now on specific books of the Bible you can study. We're offering classes on Christian theology. We're offering classes on Bible themes, classes on practical Christian issues like marriage and parenthood and how to share your faith. Christian training on how to disciple. Right now, there's a class on disciple making. And there are many more of these kinds of classes to come. That's how we want to be using our 930 Sunday mornings, is training you in a full, well-rounded curriculum of specific things to make you a whole, growing, maturing disciple in Jesus. I want to lay a foundation under your feet. So that's why we keep offering more classes, and we hope to offer more at one time every Sunday as God allows us. Because I want you to know God better. I want you to know God's Word better. Because here's the deal. If you don't know, you can't grow. Hello? If you don't know the Word, you can't grow in the Lord. And so that's the second layer. The third layer is we're building on this foundation of the large gathering and smaller gatherings. There's a third layer that we'll be adding this year in the life of our congregation, of small groups, praying together, helping each other, studying Scripture. I'm going to say more about that next Sunday. That's coming later this year. So let me save that for next week. That's the third layer. So large, and then classrooms, and then small groups, 
And then the one-on-one -on -one discipleship. That's the fourth layer. One-on-one, -on -one, life on life, discipling someone and being discipled. It's mentoring. All of this is fundamental, foundational work that everyone in the life of the church is called to get in on, and you can start doing it today. You can start meeting with someone regularly for a biblical and spiritual conversation in prayer. You can do that. You can do that over coffee. you got Starbucks popping up all over the place. You have a kitchen. You can invite someone into your home to just meet together with someone regularly to have a Bible conversation and prayer together. Do someone some spiritual good on purpose. You can do it. And we can help you get started right now. We can help you get started. We even have a 16-week curriculum that, that covers all the key issues to get you and a friend growing in the Lord. You can do this. You can meet 16 times and lays all the groundwork. And that bursts into conversations and a relationship that will last years and years and years. A spiritually grounded conversation. Some of you in this room, some of you in this church need to let someone mentor you and disciple you like these grown men let Jesus do with them, who, who didn't have too much pride that they couldn't have their life spoken into by someone who's further along in the Lord. And some of you need to be in that chair. And if you will do that, you'll be teachable. Your spiritual life will burst with growth and increase with bringing more glory to God, which I suspect at your heart of hearts is what you want more than anything. Some of you need to right now identify someone you can disciple right now. Identify someone you can mentor and pour your life and your love and God's word into and to do them some spiritual good on purpose. And not just hope, but by brushing by them, you'll help them. But bring them under your wing. And I'm, let me level with you. Some of you are so experienced in the Lord. You've walked, some of you have walked with God so long. You know the Word so well. I mean, it's doubtful that you even show up here on classes on Sunday mornings and hear something you haven't heard before because you've been saved and you know the Bible so well. It's rare that you learn something completely new and, and groundbreaking to your mind that you've not heard taught in the Bible before. That's some of you in this room. Here's what's going to happen. In 10 years, in 15 years, 20 years, some of you won't be here anymore. I mean, if things go the way they go, right? You're going to be gone. We're going to look around. There's going to be no one here who knows what you had to share. There's going to be no one here who lives for Christ like you learn to live for Christ. And this church will be the worst for it. And all those years of investment and pouring in your service and your love and your coming and your money and all of that learning, all that investment that you've made in the church is going to be nowhere to be found because you have no disciples. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. I don't want you to be gone, gone on to be with the Lord, and have no multiplication that you leave behind. And so you can start today. So don't waste another day. Find someone to pour your life and your knowledge into. Don't arrive at heaven empty-handed on this one. Let's pray. Father, Born the burden of my heart. And I pray that you would help us to follow Jesus in this particular way. Help us to grow as your people in this way. And I pray, Father, today that our hearts would be encouraged that this is your purpose and plan for us. And the fact that you haven't called us home yet means there's work to be done. There's people's lives to influence. There's discipling to be done. 
I ask you, Father, that you, by your spirit, you are the great gardener, that you would cultivate us as a disciple-making people. Whether we ever become a large church or stay a small church or whatever your purpose is, God, that we would be faithful to all that you've commanded us in the Great Commission. We're to do as you have done. So, Father, I pray that our congregation would bring you maximum glory in this day. And I ask it in Jesus' name.